1978, one film would introduce the world to one of the great horror icons, kickstart an entire subgenre, and cement its director's reputation as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. This, of course, would be John Carpenter's cinematic classic, Halloween. Two years prior, Carpenter had released another film, Assault on Precinct 13, which caught the attention of independent film producer Erwin Yablins and Mustafa Akkad, who approached him with the idea of making a horror movie about a serial killer stalking a babysitter. The idea was to create something to rival the success of The Exorcist, and with a recent string of big successes in the horror genre such as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Omen, time was right for a new entry. Carpenter agreed to make the film and began working on the story. The final product would follow the terrified Dr. Loomis as he hunted escape killer Michael Myers in a desperate attempt to stop him before he can kill again. The point of view would shift between these two characters as well as another, hapless high school babysitter Laurie Strode, who would become the target of Michael as Halloween descends on the sleepy town of Haddonfield, Illinois. The events that follow would shake the town, its citizens, and the audience to the very core and forever earn Halloween a prominent place in the annals of horror cinema history. Carpenter and his then-girlfriend Deborah Hill, whom he had previously worked with on the set of Assault on Precinct 13, began writing an early draft of the script simply titled The Babysitter Murders. However, with the recent success of another holiday-themed slasher film, Black Christmas, Yablin made the suggestion of setting the story on Halloween night, to which Carpenter agreed, as at the time, no major film had used that as a setting, odd considering it seemed like a no-brainer to set a horror film on the scariest night of the year. The script took somewhere between a week and a half to three weeks to complete, and many of the creative decisions were left to Carpenter and Hill to do as they pleased. A large portion of the early ideas of the story would center on Halloween, in particular the Celtic, or rather Gaelic, festival of Samhain, hilariously mispronounced as Sam Hain in the sequel. In ancient tradition, Samhain, which is also the modern Gaelic word for November, was a time of the year that ancient Gaels believed to be when the veil separating the worlds of the living and the other world was at its weakest, allowing all sorts of ghouls and ghosts to cross over. An idea that would be worked into the story of Michael Myers returning to his hometown on the night of Halloween to finish what he started 15 years prior. While the concept of Sao and its connection to the film didn't really show up in the finished product, it would be much more further elaborated upon in the novelization as well as in subsequent sequels that would follow in the years to come. But it was an idea that had been there from the earliest draft of the story. Many of the characters were inspired by people that Hill and Carpenter knew or were homages to other greats of the genre that had come before. The fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois itself was named after Deborah Hill's own hometown of Haddonfield, New Jersey, whereas the street names of the town would be lifted from those of John Carpenter's hometown of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Michael Myers was the name of a British film producer, and Laurie Strode was named after an ex-girlfriend of Carpenter. Several other characters in the film would be named after characters found in Hitchcock thrillers, which would have a profound impact on the creation of Halloween, as well as a number of other Carpenter productions. While Carpenter spent most of his time crafting the overall mythos of the story surrounding Michael Myers and the town, as well as the dialogues of Dr. Loomis, Hill would go on to write a majority of the supporting character dialogues. Carpenter's inspiration for Myers came from a visit to a psychiatric hospital he had done in Kentucky during college, as well as a number of small-town haunted house urban legends that would be woven together to form the perfect backdrop for what would become a cult classic icon. Due to the low budget, which amounted to a total of around $300,000, much of the cast of the film would be relatively unknown at the time of production. The supporting roles of Annie Brackett and Linda Vanderklok, the friends of the lead character, would go to Nancy Kice, who had previously worked with Carpenter in Assault on Precinct 13, and P.J. Souls, who had a role in the 1976 adaptation of Stephen King's Carrie. Kice, also sometimes credited as Nancy Loomis, would go on to work with Carpenter again in 1980's The Fog, as as well as Halloween 3 as an unrelated character. The role of Sheriff Brackett would be played by Charles Cyphers, yet another alum of Carpenter's previous film, Assault on Precinct 13. He would reprise the role in Halloween 2 and again in Halloween Kills, and would also work with Carpenter in 1980's The Fog and 1981's Escape from New York. Michael Myers himself, or rather The Shape, as he's referred to in the final credits, would be a role shared by Nick Castle, Tony Moran, and Tommy Lee Wallace. Moran would play the character toward the end of the film when he's briefly seen without his mask, 
while Nick Castle, who is a lifetime friend of Carpenter, would be most widely known as the actor behind The Shape. Castle would later go on to have a successful career as a director and writer in his own right, helming a number of films including 1984's The Last Starfighter. He would also reprise the role of Michael Myers in both the 2018 direct sequel, also simply titled Halloween, and its 2021 follow-up Halloween Kills. For the role of Dr. Samuel Loomis, Myers' psychologist and the protagonist of many of the early Halloween films, Carpenter initially wanted to cast either Peter Cushing or Christopher Lee, both icons of the genre who starred in many horror films in the 50s to 70s for British studio Hammer films. However, the limited budget was cited as the reason that their agents would turn down the offer. Lee in particular would later lament that turning down the role was one of the worst mistakes of his career. Instead, the role would eventually go to Donald Pleasance, another veteran British actor who had had a number of roles in horror films in the past, including roles in films alongside both Cushing and Lee, but was also renowned for his roles in such films as The Great Escape, The Eagle Has Landed, and of course as James Bond's arch-nemesis Ernst Blofeld in 1967's You Only Live Twice. Pleasance would later tell Carpenter that he only accepted the role because his daughter, who was a guitarist, was a fan of his score in Assault on Precinct 13. He would be paid $20,000 for the role, by far the most money given to any one member of the cast, double what Carpenter himself was paid to write, direct, and score the film, and Pleasance would go on to reprise the role in Halloween 2, 4, 5, and 6, which would sadly be released after his death in 1995. Additionally, Pleasance would also work with Carpenter on 1981's Escape from New York, as well as 1989's Prince of Darkness. Finally, the role of the lead character, Laurie Strode, was initially planned to be played by Anne Lockhart, who would later go on to star in several other horror films as well as the 1978 series Battlestar Galactica. However, she had to turn down the roles her schedule at the time didn't allow it. Instead, the character of Laurie would be played by then-unknown Jamie Lee Curtis. Carpenter later admitted that he had no idea who she was at the time, however Deborah Hill pushed for her to get the part after learning that she was the daughter of actress Janet Lee, who had played the iconic role of Marion Crane in Alfred Hitchcock's classic thriller 1960's Psycho. Hill knew that casting Curtis in the lead would make for great promotional marketing since it would give their film a direct connection to Hitchcock, who as previously mentioned had been a major influence on the film's production. Although initially hesitant to accept the part as the 19-year-old Curtis said she had much more in common with the characters of the other two girls than the quiet and reserved Strode, she eventually accepted the part which would forever cement her as an iconic screen queen of the late 70s and early 80s, and despite not being a fan of horror herself, the role would also make her one of the earliest and most influential examples of the final girl trope that would become so prevalent in the genre. Jamie Lee Curtis would go on to reprise the role of Laurie Strode in 1981 sequel Halloween 2, as well as 1998's H2O, and briefly in its sequel Halloween Resurrection, and then once again in the 2018 Halloween Reboot and its sequel Halloween Kills, and will again be playing the role in the follow-up to that film titled Halloween Ends, which at the time of this recording is scheduled for an October 2022 release. Additionally, Curtis would go on to have a number of other roles in the horror genre, particularly slashers and such films as Prom Night and Terror Train, as well as collaborating once again with Carpenter in The Fog before branching out into other genres beginning in the mid-1980s. She would also become close friends with writer Deborah Hill until her unfortunate passing in 2005. Halloween was filmed in just 20 days on a budget of only $300,000, which while considered small even for the time, was approximately triple that of Assault on Precinct 13 and was one of the primary reasons the film was financed. Famously, the financier, Mustafa Khad, had his reservations about the film initially, but was reassured by Carpenter that he could make the film with the budget and considering at the time he was also producing another film that was costing nearly the same amount of money per day, he happily agreed to fund it. Akkad himself would continue to finance the Halloween films until his untimely death in 2005 in a terrorist attack in Amman, Jordan, making him one of the only people to be attached to all of the films in the franchise up to that point. Due to the low budget, many of the cast provided their own outfits for their characters, with Jamie Lee Curtis purchasing Laurie's entire wardrobe for under $100 at JCPenney's. 
Additionally, many of the cast members would also help out in other ways during filming, effectively doubling as production assistants and crew members. Tommy Lee Wallace, the production designer and editor, who at the time was married to supporting actress Nancy Kice, would be one of the most influential members of the crew. Like much of the cast, Wallace had also worked with Carpenter on his earlier endeavors having served as an associate art director on his debut film, Dark Star, as well as working on sound effects for Assault on Precinct 13. Wallace would later collaborate with Carpenter again in The Fog and Big Trouble in Little China, as well as write and direct Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. He's perhaps most famous for creating the shape's iconic bluish-white mask, which he repurposed from a William Shatner Captain Kirk mask he purchased for less than $2 from a local costume shop. As filming took place in Southern California in May, the crew had to improvise in order to give it the look of a Midwestern town in late October, including painting bags full of fake leaves to give scenes an autumn look, and then collecting them all to reuse throughout the production. Great care was also taken to try to film in areas that didn't feature palm trees, though some may still be seen in some of the earlier establishing shots. Viewers may also notice that although the fallen leaves are the correct color, all of the trees lying the streets of Haddonfield are still green. Carpenter wanted to devise a way to alter the trees themselves, but was unable to do so due to time and budgetary constraints. Like other Carpenter films, he also created the film's iconic score in just three days, which he is said was inspired by the soundtracks of Suspiria and The Exorcist. Halloween's music is just one of many aspects that set it apart from other films of the time and would allow it to continue to outshine most of the subsequent films it would go on to inspire. Carpenter would also often cite the films of Howard Hawks as a major influence on his career, and in fact Assault on Precinct 13 had initially been intended to be a western in the style of Rio Bravo. It's interesting to note that in several scenes while Laurie is babysitting the children, the 1951 Hawks-produced film, The Thing from Another World, can be seen playing on the TV. Carpenter would of course go on to make a remake of that film, adapting the same 1938 novella, John W. Campbell's Who Goes There?, that inspired Hawk's classic. John Carpenter's The Thing would be released in 1982, and although it was largely a commercial and critical failure at the time, it would go on to garner a vast cult following and today is widely regarded as one of, if not the greatest sci-fi horror film ever made. A film definitely worthy of its own retrospective in the future. Halloween premiered on October 25th, 1978, making more than a million dollars in its opening weekend and would go on to gross more than 70 million in its initial run, making it one of the most profitable independent films of all time, despite having only limited advertising. Critically, the film received mixed reviews at the time of its release, but word of mouth amongst general audience goers ensured Halloween's success. Later, it would gain an even greater following after its home video release on VHS and Betamax the following year. NBC would purchase the television rights for $3 million and begin airing it in October of 1981, which also served as a means of promoting the sequel, which was released on October 30th of that year. During the filming of Halloween 2, Carpenter also filmed 12 minutes of additional scenes for the television cut in order to help it fill its running time to fit the two-hour time slot required by the studio. Despite its minuscule budget and incredibly short production time frame, Halloween would go on to become a major moneymaker and many critics who were initially dismissive of the film would later revisit it and praise it for its mastery of camera angles and usage of minimalist score to invoke terror in the viewers. Today the film is widely regarded as one of the greatest examples of the slasher genre held up to other classics such as Psycho, which greatly inspired its creation. Presently, the film holds a 96% fresh rating on critical aggregate site Rotten Tomatoes. The film's financial success would spawn a whole series of sequels as well as influence a number of other studios to greenlight their own slasher films to cash in on the success of Halloween. Many of which, such as Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street, would become iconic classics in their own right, with their own characters every bit as well known as Michael Myers. A tie-in novelization written by Richard Curtis would be released by Bantam Books in 1979 and would further expound upon some of the plot elements introduced in the film, especially the details revolving around Saw and the evil presence that surrounds Myers, which would be given even greater focus in some of the sequels going forward. Also, in 1983, a full five years after the film's release, a video game tie-in for the Atari 2600 would be released. As is the case with most Atari 2600 titles, the similarities to the film is limited beyond the music and basic concept of a killer on the loose. 
Perhaps the title is best known for the fact that many of the cartridges were released without an official label as a means of reducing production costs. Instead, most were sold with a simple white label with the title written in marker, a fact that was mentioned in episode 36 of the popular internet show Angry Video Game Nerd. And an interesting coincidence is that the AVGN himself, James Rolfe, also grew up in the Haddonfield, New Jersey area. Following the success of the first film, a sequel simply titled Halloween 2 was greenlit and released on October 30th, 1981. Although it was directed by Rick Rosenthal, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill would return as the writers and producers of the film, as would much of the cast, including Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Pleasance. Initially filmed as an end to the saga, taking place on the same night and picking up immediately after the ending of the first film. As this was planned to be the end of the Michael Myers story, the third film in the series, 1982's Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, would take a drastically different turn and have nothing to do with the previous two films. In fact, the first Halloween film can be seen as a movie being advertised on TV, proving that it takes place in a completely different timeline. With the idea being that the series would live on as a string of unrelated horror stories, with the common thread being that they would all take place on Halloween. While Carpenter and Hill would again return as producers on the third installment, Season of the Witch would be written and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace, the man who had worked on the set of the first film as the production designer and editor as well as a stand-in for Michael Myers himself at certain points during the filming. While Halloween 3 was profitable, it made significantly less than its predecessors, and many moviegoers were disappointed that the film didn't follow the formula and characters established in the first two films. Although often considered an outlier and given mostly negative reviews by critics at the time, Halloween 3 has since gone on to enjoy a cult following of its own in recent years. As the third installment was deemed too radically different for most mainstream audiences who were looking for something more familiar, the fourth film, titled Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, would follow the plot established in the first two films and be released six years later in 1988. As the title suggests, it would feature the return of the iconic killer as well as Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis, who once again comes back to foil Michael. The next two subsequent sequels, 1989's Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, and 1995's Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers would continue this plotline. These three films would be collectively known as the Thorn Trilogy, leaning much more heavily into the ideas of Samhain and ritualistic cultists that were only briefly touched upon in the original novelization as well as Halloween 2. The sixth film in the franchise would feature one of Donald Pleasant's final roles as he unfortunately passed away from heart failure at the age of 75, several months prior to the release of Curse of Michael Myers. Many of the plot points presented in the Thorn trilogy proved to be quite controversial, so it was decided to wipe the slate clean and restart the series with the franchise's seventh installment, Halloween H2O, 20 years later, which would act as a soft reboot, essentially ignoring the events of Halloween 4, 5, and 6, and instead following Laurie Strode, once again played by Jamie Lee Curtis, 20 years after the events depicted in Halloween 1 and 2. H2O would be released in 1998, and proved to be a much bigger success than any of the previous installments, grossing $75 million at the box office, which prompted the studio to make a direct sequel, 2002's Halloween Resurrection, which would greatly underperform both critically and financially. In 2007, a remake of the original film would be made by musician-turned-filmmaker Rob Zombie, which would also be a financial success, spawning a much less popular sequel two years later. Following the loss of rights to the Halloween franchise by Dimension Films, the property would be bought up by popular horror film studio Blumhouse, and Michael Myers would be revived yet again for a new trilogy of films. The first film in this series, simply titled Halloween, would be released in 2018 and feature the return of Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode once again, as well as Nick Castle returning the role of Michael Myers, a role he had not played since the original film. Also rejoining the production this time was John Carpenter himself, who would provide the film score as well as his input in the creative process for the first time since Halloween 3. This new reimagining of the franchise would ignore the events of every previous film except the 1978 original and pick up 40 years later in a similar manner to the way H2O had done 20 years prior. 
Halloween was released in October of 2018 to wild success, grossing more than $255 million on a budget of 10, and ensuring that the filmmakers would see their three-picture plan go forward. The sequel, Halloween Kills, would debut in 2021, releasing simultaneously in theaters as well as NBC streaming service Peacock, which would also be a financial success and featured the return of many of the supporting characters seen in early installments of the series. This particular storyline is set to conclude in 2022 with the release of Halloween Ends. While the 1978 film has spawned 11 sequels as well as numerous comic books and game tie-ins and inspired the creation of countless other films in the genre, it's hard to think of one that has had a greater impact than the original movie, which to this day stands out as a shining example of how bigger isn't always better and sometimes a minimalist approach to horror is the best approach. There were films that inspired Halloween, such as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Black Christmas, and of course Psycho. It didn't invent the slasher genre, but it did perfect it, and it'd be difficult to say that any other film had a greater impact on that particular subgenre of horror cinema. And thanks to the masterful performances of Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Pleasance, and others, as well as the writing and directing prowess of John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, and the many talented people both in front of and behind the camera, it is an impact that is felt to this day and is likely to continue to inspire filmmakers for many years to come. I hope you enjoyed this look back on the making, influences, and legacy of Halloween. And as always, thanks for watching.